<laughs> so. All right, so please, pay attention. You're going to learn something. All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, guys. The only thing I ask is no snoring. We try to you know, <laughs> keep everything interesting here. So, again, so again, if you want to go take a look at some of my videos, that's my channel right there. Um, I do work for Tektronix. Thank you. Uh, I've been with Tektronix about 10 years, but I'm basically an analog design engineer at heart. Um, but I've you know, done for 25 years before joining Tektronix. So I've been a scope pilot for a long time. So uh, was it about four years ago we did uh, scopes for dopes yeah, at Info Age? <laughs> so I think it was two, 2011, I think. Okay, so, and that was, you know, so um, what I'm going to cover is reviewing a little bit of what we call, talked about in that class to kind of bring everybody back up to that same speed again. And then we'll talk about going through and looking at some of these signals and these radios and how you set up a scope mm -hmm. and things like that. So first thing I want to ask is who's got a scope? Okay, good, good. Hands down. How many of them are sitting under the bench collecting dust? Right now. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's okay. So, <laughs> so, um, so how many are afraid to use it, don't want to use it, don't, you know, that kind of a thing, don't want to make sure you don't, don't blow anything up when you connect up to it? How many one? Yeah, well, I've, yeah, I've got about seven or eight of them myself. So, <laughs> so I only have three, but okay. I don't get much. But um, it's, a, it's an addiction, you know. But you guys got all the radios, I got all the scoops. So, <laughs> so, but, so the idea here is, to get you familiar enough to know what the basic controls do on the scope and to understand what it can show show you inside these radios and you know what to look for, you know, what settings to use, how to hook it up, how not to hurt something, that kind of thing. So that's what we want to talk about today. Okay. And again, this is really for you guys. If you've got any questions as we go along here, stop me and let me know. Because I want to you know, I'm not here to just listen to myself talk. <laughs> I want to make sure that I give you guys information that you can use. Okay. So Today's agenda. Again, just reviewing the oscilloscope basics, what the basic controls are for controlling the display, controlling the vertical aspects of the scope, and how, it, you know, how we adjust that, how we control the horizontal aspects of the scope, and triggering controls, which are probably the most confusing thing for people. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about probes, why we use them, what they are, and we'll talk about safety, especially when it comes to dealing with you know, tube circuits and big uh, plate voltages and things like that. And the fact that, you know, where is ground and that kind of thing, we're going to worry about that. And we'll do this using this really nice uh, 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 you know, kind of trainer that, uh, that Al provided to me. Um, it's a typical All-American 5 you know, type of uh, AM radio. Uh, so we'll be able to look at some of the signals in the power supply and mixer and converter, IF, detector, and AF stages within that radio. And we'll take a look at how do we set up a scope, you know, how do we go look at that. Um, so this way you can go see what they are. You know, most of you guys will restore radios and things like that using nothing more than a multimeter, and I think that's great. But sometimes you get the tricky problems, they might want to go in and actually see what's going on with some of those things. Okay, so that's why we want to talk about scopes. So what is a scope? Now I'm going to talk mainly about um, kind of analog scopes like these guys here. They do have you know, kind of a newer, fancy you know, digital scope we can talk about later if we want to. But I figure if you guys have got scopes sitting on your bench, there's probably something more like those and not like this. Okay, I work for Tektronix, so I get to play with the cool toys. So, yeah. but uh, but on my bench, I've got those too. <laughs> okay, because I really like using the old analog scopes. Okay, so uh, we're going to use this one here uh, because uh, when Bob brings the camera over to it, the settings for horizontal and vertical and things like that are right on the screen itself. So uh, you will actually be able to see that. So he's, oh, okay, he's looking at that. We need about 500 millivolts of division vertically to see those types of things. Where it's a lot easier to see than where the pointer is on some of these older scopes. Okay, so that's why I brought that one in. So what do these old analog scopes do? How do they master the waveform? You know, the faster we need to move that beam to spread the waveform out to see it, okay? So, um, so we'll talk about the various controls that we use to do that and set up the scope to measure particular signals. Uh, the screen itself has got a number of divisions on it. And we'll refer to a number of the settings by division. Like we say a vertical control, we're going to set it to 100 millivolts of division. But what that means is the beam will move one division for every 100 millivolts you apply to the input. Okay, so if I got 100 millivolts of division, I got a signal that occupies three divisions, I know that signal is 300 millivolts peak to peak. Right. Same thing with the horizontal divisions. We're going to talk about that in so many milliseconds per division or so many microseconds per division. That's how fast we're moving the beam across the screen. Okay, we can use that to measure frequency, kind of a, not the most accurate way to do it, but it's one way to do it. 
So the major divisions, and it's typically 10 by 10, um, or sometimes it's 10 by 8. Uh, those are the ones we'll, that we'll talk about in terms of divisions. There are subdivisions that allow you to get make the measurements a little more precisely, but when we set the settings on the scope, it's referring to these major divisions. Okay. So the display system, we've got a couple of controls that kind of deal with that. Um, basically, there is a, a trace rotation, focus and intensity. Focus and intensity are kind of obvious. Beam finder is one of those handy ones where if it's, the waveform is way off the screen somewhere, the beam finder will reduce the deflection voltages to kind of bring that thing on screen so you can kind of tell where it is. So you can adjust your controls to get this, the waveform back on. And I just kind of showed a couple of what you know, some of these things look like. Illumination is typically for the scale illumination, okay, to light that up. Focus and intensity are going to be, you know, on the beam itself, uh, kind of obvious controls. Trace rotation, um, we use magnetic deflection here, so depending on where the scope is and the magnetic fields in your house, uh, sometimes the, the trace might rotate one way or the other, it won't be flat across the screen. The trace rotation allows you to correct for that, and if you move the scope to the other side of the bench, you might have to do it again. Okay. That's what the trace rotation is. Doesn't mean there's something wrong with the scope, but doesn't mean you have to go in there and turn it. Just adjust that trace rotation thing. Okay. So those are the basic controls for just you know brightness and visibility of the screen. Simple things. They're usually grouped together. Okay. Pretty simple. Okay. The vertical system. This is the one you're going to use probably most. And what this does is controls how many volts does it take to move one division or two division or three divisions on the screen. Okay. Uh, you've got an input signal coming in, and there's a number of controls that we, that we use to process that signal as it comes through. Like we amplify it, attenuate it, and move it around, change its position, that type of a thing. So we've got a coupling control that we'll talk about in a moment, a volts per division control or sensitivity control, a position control, where we're going to place that trace on the screen, up or down. A mode control, because sometimes we'll have more than one trace. So how do we want to interlace those two traces? How do we want to work with that? Okay. So those are the controls we'll talk about that go into the amplifier that drive the vertical <coughs> reflection plates that move the beam up or down as it's being swept across. Okay. So let's look at some of those controls. Am I going too fast? Am I good? Okay. okay. I know I'm not going too slow, so nobody's snoring yet, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the vertical scale and coupling controls. And uh, again, I put a bunch of them up here, so depending on what scope you have, you might recognize, oh, that looks like mine, or that one looks like mine. That's why I put a bunch of them up here. So let's first talk about coupling, okay? AC coupling or DC coupling. Now, what I want, uh, something I want to make kind of clear is that when you're using your multimeter to make some of your measurements, you've got, you know, AC volts or DC volts to make AC measurements or DC measurements, okay? On a scope, AC or DC coupling doesn't mean that I use DC coupling to only look at DC signals and I use AC coupling to only look at AC coupling. That's not what it means. Okay? Oftentimes we might want to use AC coupling on signals that primarily have DC content and mm -hmm. vice versa. We'll talk about why. Um, all that refers to is how we're going to process that signal from the input connector to go to the amplifier. Now let's say, for example, I want to look at ripple on a power supply. Okay, I've got a B plus line that's sitting at 95 volts. Maybe it's got two volts of ripple on it. If I DC couple the scope, right, I might have to set it to 10 volts of division, so, I, so that 95 volts is about nine and a half divisions. If I've got 10 volts of division, and I want to look at that little two, two volt peak to peak ripple, it's going to be this tiny little wibbly thing at the top. Mm -hmm. And you can't see it. You might adjust the position of the trace down and maybe go down to five volts of division, and then you can still see it. And you adjust it down one more time, and now I can't adjust the position down far enough anymore because the signal's above the screen. So what you do is you use AC coupling. AC coupling throws a capacitor in series with that, blocks the DC, but the AC passes right through. Now I can adjust by, you know, I can adjust to, you know, a half a volt per division. Even though I've got 95 volts DC, I block the DC. Now I'm just looking at the AC content. It makes it really easy to see that small AC content sitting on top of a large DC offset. So AC or DC coupling doesn't mean that you're looking at just AC or DC signals. It really determines how do I want to process that signal. And to be quite honest, most of the time we're going to be looking at signals inside of a tube radio. We're going to be using AC coupling because all mm -hmm. we care about is what the wave shape looks like. Mm -hmm. We know where what its DC offset is, right? You measure that with the voltmeter. 
Mm -hmm. Right? We want to look to see if the waveform is distorted in any way. So just eliminate the DC, go to AC coupling, and look at those signals. Okay? So that's what the coupling is. Now the volts per division setting is sometimes called the vertical attenuator or vertical scale control. You can see here it's, it says volts per div, volts per div. Um, on this one it says vertical attenuator. If you've got a scope that says vertical attenuator, it's a pretty old scope. It's what we call an old recurrent sweep scope. Um, but they're generally uncalibrated. These guys are generally calibrated in so many volts per division. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's another one here, volts per division. Okay, so that will just determine, obviously, you know, how many volts it takes to make, you know, the waveform, so you can make those measurements. Now, one thing you want to note is the scope's input impedance. It's typically printed by the input connector. Uh, this says you know, one meg ohm and 20 picofarads. Okay, this one says. 1 meg ohm, 25 picofarads. This one could be 1 meg ohm or 50 ohms, depending on what you set it to. Okay? And you also notice here's the coupling, AC or DC. Okay? Here's coupling on this one, AC or DC. Okay? Coupling AC or DC. Okay? So all of these scopes will have these various controls. You pick which ones you need for the measurements you need to make. Okay? And the reason I want to say note the input impedance is that later on when we talk about probes, the probes can be adjusted to compensate them, to, to match the frequency response of the scope. And the probes themselves will have a range of input capacities that they can compensate over. So if you've got a probe that can only compensate from 10 to 20 picofarads, and I've got this scope that's got a 25 picofarad input, it won't be able to be a properly adjusted to use with that scope. We'll cover that in a little bit. Make sense, though? Mm -hmm. Okay. But that will typically be, be printed you know, on the front panel. Okay. Typically, the maximum input voltage will be printed as well, so it's good to take note of that. So there's a lot of good information on that front panel if someone hasn't cleaned it off. Okay. So, all pretty clear on the vertical controls? Mm -hmm. okay. So, vertical modes. Now, this is typically if, we, if we've got more than one channel that we want to display. There may be some good reasons for that. It might have two signals you want to compare, maybe a, the input to an amplifier stage and the output to the amplifier stage. Is the signal inverting, so if you know it's an inverting amplifier? Is the input clean and the output distorted? You know, that type of a thing. You can mm. compare those things. You can compare the volts per division. Not get a, each one can have two different volts per division, so you can actually measure gain by measuring the input amplitude and the output amplitude. So there may be good reasons to have two channels or more. Okay. When we're displaying those two channels, most of these scopes, vast majority of them, are just a single <coughs> beam scope. It's a single trace. So how do I display two traces or two, two different channels? Um, the answer is you use one of these two modes, one called alt, one called chop. Alt or alternate means that we're going to switch and display trace one, trace two, trace one, trace two on alternate sweeps. Okay? And normally the sweep is going fast enough that you don't notice that. Mm -hmm. okay? It flickers back and forth between them, but the, there's enough persistence in the phosphor that everything looks like you know, they're both just running all the time. Uh, when you slow down the sweep speeds to something a few, a few milliseconds or more per division, you might start seeing them flip, 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 right? If we go over to the scope here, for example, and uh, let's put on a second channel. So you can see that second channel there. And let's see, let me go to my alt mode and slow down. You can kind of see it's going one, the other one, the other one, one, the other one, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's where the chop mode, what that does, Chop basically, while the sweep is happening, it's bouncing back and forth between the two pretty quickly. Okay. okay. So that it looks like I've got the two traces going on very quickly, but Almost what it's doing is tracing one, and then flopping down, tracing the other, tracing the first one, tracing the other one, bouncing back and forth, and you don't really see it. It's chopping back and forth between the two. So you use chop mode when you have more than one trace at these low sweep speeds, but at the faster sweep speeds, you can go to the alternate mode. That's why there's two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's what they mean. Let me turn off uh, channel two there. Okay. So there's these other two controls, add and invert. You say, well, why would they really be useful? Why would I want to add channel one to channel two? Well, oftentimes you don't. There aren't really many applications where you really want to add the two. But, but what can be really handy is to subtract the two. Right? Because subtracting the two allows you to measure the voltage across a component. Right? Measure the voltage here minus the voltage here tells me the voltage across that component. Well, I don't have a subtract function, but I've got an add and an invert. Mm. So if I 
invert channel 2, then I add them together, that's the same thing as doing a subtraction. Okay? So the add and invert, so there's my invert and add. So I invert channel 2 and add the two, it's the same thing as doing a subtraction of the two. And a good example where that could be useful is on the audio output stage. Okay, the, driving the primary the, of the uh, output transformer, that, that B plus typically has got a couple of volts of <laughs> ripple on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, because before the bigger ballast resistor, right. the rest of the B plus. So if you just look at it with respect to ground, you got a big ripple and the audio riding on top of that. Mm. But if you prove that signal and you prove that B plus that's bouncing around with channel two, invert and subtract it, the result is just going to be the audio. Mm. Pretty cool? Yeah. Okay. I know that. That Ooh. was cool. So that's that. So this is a really handy thing to measure something, the voltage across a component. Okay. And the reason for that is a big, we're going to talk about this in a minute when we talk about safety, is that the big difference between this and this is that you can put these two probes anywhere you want. If you want to measure the voltage across a component, you put the probes across that component, right? Because these, this is completely isolated. The scope mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. Okay, if you look at the scope probes, right, you got the probe connector there. It could be a little hook, it could be whatever. And you've got your other lead here. That's ground. So I can't just place that across any component because that connects ground to wherever you put it. Mm. Okay, so that's the big difference, and that's why this difference mode can be really handy, because I can't just clip this across my component. There are special probes called differential probes that allow you to do that, but that's not most of the probes that you have. Okay, so we'll go play with that in a little while too. All good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take a look now at the horizontal system. The horizontal system is what moves the beam from one side of the screen to the other. Okay, how quickly do we move it? And again, we're using magnetic deflection, so we're essentially applying a voltage to these plates that are pulling the beam from one side of the screen to the other. And then very quickly retracing it back and doing it again. Okay? Mm. So how quickly we move that is controlled by this little sweep generator. Mm. And that has controls for number of seconds per division, milliseconds, microseconds, nanoseconds, you know, et cetera, per division. And there's some trigger controls and some mode controls we'll talk about with that. And there's a trigger that's going to get into that too. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the bottom line is that we're generally, the scope is moving that beam back and forth. There is another mode in the scope we'll also mention called XY mode. And this is where, say, channel one can drive the vertical and channel two can drive the horizontal. So rather than having the horizontal driven by the sweep generator, we have the horizontal driven by another input. And there's some applications for that too. We'll talk about that. Okay. So, so the sweep control is often called the time base, okay? Or on the modern digital scopes, it's called the horizontal scale because there's no sweep on the modern scopes, <laughs> right? So uh, I remember I, I, I'm an application engineer for Tektronics, right? We make oscilloscopes with a lot of test equipment. And I had a, a new young sales engineer came in and I said, oh, well, adjust the time, make the time base faster. And he was, where's the time base control? Right? <laughs> Horizontal scale, okay, horizontal, you know, <laughs> never used an analog scope before, so I didn't know what, 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 what the time base was, so, but we can do it. So we talk about sweeping that, there's actually two ways that that works. There's these old recurrent sweep scopes, if you have one, get rid of it and get a new, get a more <laughs> modern one like these. <laughs> okay? Is this a sales pitch? No, 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 I'm not even, I'm not even saying buy that, get one of these. Okay, because the problem is the recurrent sweep scopes, what they do is they have a free running sawtooth oscillator that's driving the, the horizontal beam. But it's a free running oscillator. So when you put a signal in there, the signal, if it's not perfectly locked or synchronized to that signal, it, it looks like your signal's walking back and forth on the screen, right? It's not, it's not steady, okay? In some cases, that's fine. Like if we're just looking at an IF waveform like this, who cares? Mm -hmm. right? We're not really, we don't have to be triggered on it, so that works. And there's usually some kind of a, a lock control. You can, you can kind of try to injection lock your signal to the, to the sweep, and there's some vernier controls to kind of get it. Nothing's calibrated. But today, you know, these scopes, like this scope here is, you know, over 30 years old. You can buy something like this for 100 bucks. There's no excuse to hang on to these old recurrent sweep scopes anymore unless you like the technology. Okay. But very old or simple technology. What we're talking about with these scopes is a triggered sweep. 
We still have a <coughs> horizontal ramp that drives the beam from left to right, but the horizontal ramp is kicked off by a trigger. Okay, so the trigger circuit says, send the sweep now. And then, it's, then it goes back and sits and wait for the trigger again and sends it again. Okay, so if we give it a trigger that's synchronous to your signal, now the waveform is stable. So that's what, that's what we're, talk, we're going to talk about trigger here in a moment. But they generally have a calibrated sweep time and they're more flexible and powerful than the overcurrent sweep scopes. Okay? And typical controls, you'll have a, lot, a wide range from seconds per division to up to microseconds or, net or even nanoseconds per division depending on the speed of the scope. Okay. Typically in a 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 5, 1, 2, 5, you know, 1, 2, 5, and then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, you know, that kind of a thing, type of a thing. And there is a, a vernier control if you want to get a, a variable on it, but generally you're going to, you're going to use the calibrated you know, knob, if you will. Okay. So the key here is if we're going to use this trigger sweep scope is we're going to use a triggering control. Okay. So what is triggering or synchronization? It allows us to stabilize the waveform so we can view it and actually look at its characteristics rather than have it sliding back and forth on the screen. Okay. So it typically locks the sweep rate to some feature on the waveform. So that each time I do a sweep, I sweep this section, the next one I sweep that one, the next one I sweep that one, all those traces lay on top of each other, and it looks like the waveform is stable. Okay? If, if we weren't, we're just randomly sweeping different spots, the waveform would look like it's moving back and forth, kind of like the, the wagon wheels turning backwards in the old westerns. Same reason. Okay? Again, these old recurrent sweep scopes will generally have an external sync amplitude okay, or an internal sync selector. And you, this amplitude basically takes a piece of that input signal and jams it into the horizontal oscillator to try to make it lock or you know, pull it and lock it to it. Okay? Really ugly, doesn't work very well. Okay, and it's the only control you have. Here's my comment on that. Okay, <laughs> whereas the trigger sweep scopes allow you to, to set up a, a particular trigger criteria. What do I want to trigger on? The rising edge of the signal. When it rises past a certain voltage point, trigger when that happens. Pretty simple. Okay. <coughs> Much more powerful and has a lot more capability on the trigger controls. So let's dig into that a little bit. Now, most of the time, you're going to use two or three different trigger settings on your scope, and that's about it. Well, let's kind of explore what some of those things are. Okay. So the trigger source, what are we going to be triggering on? Most times you're going to have it set to internal, meaning I'm going to pick off a piece of the input signal and, and trigger on some aspect of that input signal. Okay. So internal means I've got a signal coming into channel one or channel two, and I'm going to pick off a piece of that or, or make some adjustment on that and say I want to trigger whenever that signal, which is already in the scope, is doing something. That's internal trigger. External triggering refers to like maybe an external input, okay, that I've got to bring a signal into and use that as my trigger source. <coughs> it might be you know, somehow related to the other signal I've got going into the other input. You're probably not going to use that one much at all. Line triggering, who thinks, who knows what line triggering is? 60 cycle Trigger a 60 cycle line input, exactly. Now, where would that be handy? You want to look to see if there's any particular aspect of your signal that is synchronous to your ripple and your power supply. Okay, or something else going on on the 60 hertz line. So that way, it's a real simple thing. If I know I'm looking at ripple, or I want to look, or maybe I'm looking at an IF signal, and there's a little bit of ripple on the B plus. So if I look at it, you know, it's kind of moving all around back and forth. If I go to line triggering, I might get a, just a slanted portion of where I'm looking at a portion of the ripple, but it's stable. I'm always looking at the same portion of that because it's synchronous to the line. So mm -hmm. it can be handy to even to look, help you look at signals in the presence of ripple on your power supply, okay? Because it'll mm -hmm. stabilize the ripple, and you can look at the waveform just riding on the ripple, okay? Okay. So handy thing you know, for that. Trigger mode, okay? Okay. Now I know what I'm going to trigger on. How am I going to use it? Um, what auto trigger does is not what you think, <laughs> okay? It doesn't automatically set up a trigger for you, okay? What auto trigger does is it looks for the, the trigger condition that you set up on the controls, and if it doesn't see one, an event that you've set up, like if I didn't see a rising edge that crossed five volts, it's gonna send the sweep anyway, okay? Because if you don't do that, if you go to normal trigger, if, if you set up the trigger controls that aren't being met by the input signal, the sweep never happens, and the screen is blank, 
and you have no feedback of what's going on. So auto trigger set is going to look for that condition, and if it, does, it gets impatient, it says, ah, oh, you're not giving me a trigger, I'm sending a, a sweep anyway. But it allows you to get something going across the screen so you can see what's happening. Maybe you've got to adjust the trigger to go see it. So auto triggers where you're normally going to leave things. Okay? And you could use normal trigger, but most of the time auto trigger would be just fine. Mm -hmm. Single trigger you'll probably never use. Okay? It just sends a sweep once and then stops. It only is useful on these scopes if you've got a scope camera attached to them, okay, to kind of oh. catch that event. Okay? Uh, and TV triggering, some of the scopes you'll see TV line triggering, and that triggers on NTS, NTSC signals to pick out a particular line or something oh, like that. Okay. So you're working on TVs. This is, this is useful, you're looking at a, a video signal. This can pick off the horizontal and vertical sync pulses and trigger on those things. So that's what those are. <coughs> if you're working on the radio stuff, ignore these guys. And probably even that one. Probably, yeah. Just use auto on it. Okay? Make sense? All right. Trigger coupling. Just like on the vertical input, we can take this signal that we're sending to the trigger circuit and AC couple it or DC couple it. Okay, so again, if we want to remove the DC content, we can AC couple it, just trigger on the, the ripple portion or whatever those small DC por or small AC portion riding on top of the DC. Some other scopes will have other coupling modes like HF reject, which is high frequency reject. So you want to, you've got a low frequency signal with some high frequency stuff on it. I want to trigger on the low frequency portion of it. The HF reject is a low pass filter. That'll get rid of the high frequencies. Uh, but again, most of the time, you're using one, one of these two. two. Okay? The easiest one is typically AC coupling. But if you're looking at digital signals, I might stay zero for a long time and then go to one, AC coupling really won't help you much. Because no, that'll settle out to that DC value. Mm -hmm. right? So depending on the duty cycle of the signals, how much, you know, how much whether they're balanced or not or whatever, audio tip, typically for AC coupling is just fine. DC coupling for cases where you know you need it, okay? But uh, you can probably, you know, you can play with the others, but auto coupling, AC, internal. And what's handy is, and a lot of scope manufacturers kind of did this, you look at this scope here, the trigger controls over here. Okay, let me get my glasses on, sorry. Okay, or I'll look at that. So if you look at this, focus up on this scope here, Bob. Okay. Okay. Um, if you look here, there's a trigger mode, right? <coughs> You can see at the very top it says auto, the next one says normal, the next one says single. Here's my trigger coupling. Top is AC, then low frequency reject, high frequency reject, and DC. Okay? And source, channel one, channel two. In this case it says norm, which stands for which is the same thing as a normal trigger, which is internal trigger. Mm. But what do you notice about this? What are the most common ones I told you to use? Auto? Yeah. AC coupling? Right. And internal trigger. Internal trigger. All those are at the top of the controls. Take all the trigger controls, bring them to the top. Okay? So most tech, old Tektronix scopes are like that, and a lot of other manufacturers copied that kind of convention. Just bring all the trigger controls to the top, and you're kind of set up to auto trigger AC couple internal. And you're good to go. Okay? So let's talk about the most common controls you're going to use are just doing a simple edge trigger, triggering on a rising or falling edge of the signal. Okay, so we're going to trigger when the, the voltage on that signal comes up through a threshold and then kick off the sweep. Or we're going to trigger when the signal falls through a threshold and kick off that sweep. Okay, so that's the, some scopes call it the slope or polarity. Okay, positive means that this voltage is coming up, okay, when I cross this threshold here, then I start to kick off the sweep for that waveform. If I flipped it down to negative, now I've got this voltage that's coming down, crossing that threshold, and then kicked off the sweep. So that's what the slope means. Okay? In most cases, when you're working on stuff, you don't care. But you might want, depending on what waveform you want to look at, you might want to worry about it. And you can adjust that level up or down. So if I take that voltage level, and okay, I move the level back and forth, and I move that level from this positive position here, and I turn that knob to negative down here, mm -hmm. You can see that I'm triggering at a lower voltage level down here. Okay. So, okay. So that's how those four controls work. Positive or negative slope, level up or down. And again, what you can do is flip the switch up, okay, the positive, and set your level control right to the middle. So if you're AC coupling, you're going to be right in the middle of your waveform. And you should get a triggered sweep for that problem. Mm. Okay. With line triggering, you don't have to worry about those. It just automatically triggers on the line. It doesn't really matter what you set those to. You can change the slope. 
but the level control really won't matter. Okay. Okay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Those four sets of controls, the display, focus, and intensity, the vertical controls for scale and coupling, horizontal controls for how fast we're sweeping things, and mm. trigger, are the, thing, the only things you got to worry about. Okay, we're setting up a, a, you know, a scope. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when you're looking at signals inside of a radio or something like that, you kind of know what the signal is supposed to look like. Right? I know if I'm looking at the beginning of an IF amplifier, that signal is going to be pretty small. Yeah. If I look at the output of the IF amp or I look at the audio output, it's going to be big. So that tells me what do I need to set my amp plane vertical controls for. Mm -hmm. Do I actually want to see the local oscillator signal? I need to sweep fast so I can see the sine wave of that. Mm -hmm. If I want to look at something that's audio related, whether it's the variation, the amplitude variation of the IF like we've been looking at here, or, or looking at the audio output stages, typically one or two milliseconds of division is, is, is pretty good to kind of look at the, the audio content. Okay. So, and but we're looking at the LO signal. It might be you know one one and a half megahertz, right? Because it's 455 kilohertz above the signal you're listening to, right? And most of these things are high side injection. So you want to sweep, sweep, bring that all the way up if you actually want to see the sine wave. Okay. So if you're sweeping really fast, we stretch that sine wave out, and you can see it. Right. So, so those are the controls you're going to worry about. So now we just have to get the signals into the scope. So we just Go over and connect wires from the scope to the radio? Well, not quite. <laughs> what I recommend always is using probes. Okay? A probe, you know, just like you know, we're not going to connect bare wires to something with a multimeter, we're not going to do that with a scope either. Um, probes allow you to connect the signal to the scope. It can minimize the loading of what you're doing. And the most common that you run across are passive probes that are called 1x or 10x probes. There are active probes and specialty probes we won't talk about. We're going to talk mainly about this. All right. So, in general, a 1x probe is a, kind of like a direct connection to the scope input. Right? So, it's just a convenient way of coming out to some connectors that are easy to connect up to your circuit that you're testing. Okay? Most of the time, you're not going to want to use 1x probes, though. There's a couple of reasons why. Um, <laughs> They don't attenuate the signal at all before it gets to the scope. So whatever voltage is there, the scope sees. So if you're working on stuff with some high B plus voltages, you got to start paying attention to what the maximum input voltage is on that scope so you don't hurt it. I hope you don't exceed it. I hope you don't exceed it. Okay. But the bigger problem is they can have pretty excessive capacitive loading. Yeah. Right? This is a you know, couple of feet of coax. Right? So if I've got you know, 20 picofarads of input capacitance on the scope, Okay, maybe I've got another 50, 60, 70, 80 picofarads in the coax. So this is like taking a 100 puff cap and connecting it to your circuit. Now, if you're looking at the audio output stage, probably not a big deal. If you're looking at a tuned circuit where the tuning caps are on the order of 20 picofarads, what happens if you put 100 picofarads in parallel with it? <laughs> okay, I think mistunes doesn't work, it doesn't happen. So most of the time you're not going to want to use 1x per okay? Most of the time, you're going to be using 10x probes. Okay, now 10x probes, effectively at the probe tip, have got like a 9 mega ohm resistor in series with the coaxial line. So that basically isolates all of that capacitance, but from, you know, puts 9 mega ohm resistance in between in between them. So the capacitance is much much lower. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's good, and we choose 9 mega ohms because that forms a 10x voltage divider between the probe tip and the 1 mega ohm input impedance of the scope. So we've got a 9 mega and 1 mega gives me a 10, a 10 to 1 voltage divider. That's why it's called a 10x probe. Doesn't okay. make things 10x bigger, it makes them 10 times smaller. Okay, so right. what it means is that the scale that you set up on the scope, if I set it to 100 millivolts of division and I connect up a 10x probe, it's now 1 volt per division, 10 times bigger. Mm -hmm. Okay, the scale is 10 times larger. Okay, it's not 10 times more sensitive. Okay. So again, all, along with the scope input, it attenuates the signal. Good thing, it dramatically reduces the effect of capacitive loading on the scope. These 10x probes might have an input capacitance of 10 or 15 picofarads. That can still be a lot okay, on some of these tuned circuits, as we'll see in a moment, but it's a whole lot less than 100 picofarads that you have with the 1x probes. Okay. The bad thing is, is they need compensation. We'll talk about that next. Okay, and uh, so it's 
So it's most likely folks should dig into that. So what is compensation? Well, here's kind of a schematic of what that probe looks like. There's the probe tip and the ground clip. There's my 9 mega ohm input resistor. There's my 1 mega ohm input impedance of the scope. Now, we said that 9 mega ohm, or the 1 mega is in parallel with, what do I say, 20 picofarads, 25 picofarads. So that's what the scope looks like. All right. So if I did that, what would happen is the frequency goes up. I've got an RC low pass filter between that 9 mega ohm resistor and that capacitor. Mm -hmm. So the bandwidth of the scope of the probe would go way down. Well, what, why the hell did I do this? So what we do is we put another capacitor in parallel with the input resistor and make the ratio of these capacitors basically the same or the inverse of this ratio. So at low frequencies, DC up to a couple of kilohertz, that 10x voltage divider is dominated by the resistors. As the frequency goes up, the 10x divide ratio is dominated by the capacitors. Okay, because the impedance of that capacitor and this capacitor at two megahertz is a lot lower than nine mega ohms and one mega ohms. Okay, but if we scale these right and get that ratio right, we we'll get the same voltage division. There will be a capacitive voltage divider instead of a resistive voltage divider. So we got to get it right. And because every scope is different mm -hmm. in terms of input capacitance, we have to be able to adjust that. That's probe compensation. Mm -hmm. So if you ever look at the front of your scope and you see this little thing that says calibrator, okay, or probe adjustment, okay, let's see, on this guy right down here, what does it say? This one says calibrator, and on this one, it's, they're both, these both say calibrator. Okay. What the calibrator is, is a, a typically about one kilohertz square wave, all right? Now, what are the characteristics of a square wave? It's got frequency components at its square. It's got frequency components at the fundamental mm -hmm. and at odd harmonics. Right. Okay, so if I go to three, so if I got a 1K square wave, I got energy at one kilohertz, three kilohertz, five kilohertz, seven kilohertz, all the way up. Okay, so now, so I got a, a broadband signal that I can now use to compensate the frequency response of the probe. Because if I, if I have the capacitors set up wrong so that the capacitive voltage divider is less than 10x, okay, at high frequency, I'll have an under undercompensated situation where the high frequency content is rolled off. It looks like a low pass filter. Okay, so, so the edges kind of get rounded. You still get the lower frequency content, full amplitude, but the high frequency content, the edges get rolled off. That's called an undercompensated probe. Okay, if I turn the capacitors the other way, that that voltage divide ratio might be greater than 10x at higher frequency. I get this situation overcompensated. The high frequencies are accentuated, they're, they're divided down by less than 10x, so I get overshoot on the waveform, undershoot on the waveform, overshoot on the waveform. So really what you do is, those little screwdrivers that came with your probes that you all threw away are stuck in the drawer. <laughs> right? You connect the probe up to the compensator, and you adjust the trimmer on the probe to make so you the get waveform that look like wave. that. Yeah. Right. Let me show you what I mean by that. We'll do it actually on one of these waveforms. Let me get the scope out of the way because I think I got my screwdriver inside here. You don't have your green axolite in your pocket. Green. That'll detune it. Oh, it's got to be ideally a non-metallic blade. Yeah. A non-metallic uh, screwdriver or one with just a tiny little metal blade in it. Because that's 10 megs. That 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 axolite will take it off. So tune it All right. Off so let's actually grab this guy here. Okay, and uh, let me go into the calibrator over here on the scope. Oh, this, this, is, this one it looks like it's pretty well compensated, doesn't it? So, so nice little one megahertz, one kilohertz square wave. But look what happens if I if I misadjusted that. Okay, there I'm overcompensated. Now you're overcompensated, right? If I adjust that down, now I'm undercompensated. Mm -hmm. All right, and if I adjust it just right, now I'm properly compensated. Now a square wave, it's really obvious. But if I was looking at say a 455 kilohertz, you know, IF signal, and I was undercompensated, it would look like that signal was really small because it gets a low pass filter. Okay. If I had it overcompensated, I looked at that LO signal or whatever it is, it might look bigger than it really is because the scope was expecting it to be attenuated by 10x, and it's not. So you want to properly compensate your scopes. 
Go find your screwdrivers, confiscate your probes. Okay? <laughs> it's amazing how many professional engineers that I run across over the 25 years when I was a design engineer and now the 10, 10 years that I've been with Tektronics that have never compensated their clients. Anybody got a green axle right here? <laughs> Show them what it does to that waveform when you touch the trimmer. Yeah, I don't have one. Yeah, put yeah. the trimmer in there and the waveform goes wacky. Yeah, yeah, goes yeah, it goes yeah. totally silent. Yeah. <laughs> you tune it with that and then you take the screwdriver away and then it's back to running. Yeah, again. Exactly yeah. right. <laughs> so what's the lesson here? Compensate your Compensate probes. Your probe. Use 10x probes because what it does, it does reduce the voltage going to the scope by 10x. So if I've got a 200 volt B plus in the radio, the scope's only going to see 20 volts. It's not going to care about that, right? So always a good idea to use 10x probes. They have lower loading, and they uh, uh, so they won't distort your waveform as much, and uh, and they'll also give you more. Safety. I think they had a guy at Sussex selling them too. Yeah. So two more weeks, get get, get 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 a probe. So you'll find some. Okay? <laughs> but that's what that little trimmer is on it. On some probes, the adjustment is actually on the probe body. On other, they might act as adjustments might actually be on the probe handle and you know, the probe body itself here. It all depends on the construction of the probe. Mm -hmm. You'll find some probes that have got the 1x, 10x switch on them, right? Move it in the 10x position, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, so uh, something else to think about is that most scopes are, you know, the inexpensive analog, you know, scopes they don't know whether you've got a 1x probe or a 10x probe attached to them. Okay, so you have, if you know you're using a 10x probe, you have to mentally know that you're going to change that scale. If I set it to 100 millivolts, it's really going to be one volt. Okay, if you look at the scope like this, focus on this one, Bob. Um, you can actually, there's actually two little lights that light up. I don't have that turned on. Because th these scopes will actually sense whether it's a 1x or a 10x probe, and it will adjust, it will light up the number under the skirt appropriately, okay? Um, and the way it does that, if you look at these scope probes, you can see the little pin on the side here. Okay, I'm flicking it with my finger. I don't know if you'll be able to see that little pin there. Yeah, you had it there. There you go. Get the that focus. There it is. That pin contacts a ring here. And there's a resistor in there that tells it, hey, that's a 10x probe. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the scope here, you see that says, what does that say, 20 millivolts of division down in the corner there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Watch what happens when I connect the scope up, the probe. It just went to 200 millivolts of division. It knows. A lot of scopes won't know. That's a smart one. <laughs> right. This is a smart one. A lot of scopes won't know, so you have to know. Okay. So that, that might explain why, hey, I, I measured this voltage. It's 10 times bigger than it should be. <laughs> you know, using a 10x probe, that's why. Right. Okay. Because your scale isn't what you thought it was. Alan, yeah. I play devil's advocate with you. Tektronics probes. Yes. Chinese probes. Mm -hmm. In general, you get what you pay for. Okay. In most cases, I mean, for what we're doing here, you know, you can buy a ten dollar probe on eBay or Amazon or something like that, and it'll work fine. It may not hold up for some of these probes are thirty years old. It may it may not last thirty years, but it was ten bucks. They don't care. Okay. And the frequency response might not be perfectly flat. But again, for what we're doing here, we're looking for, hey, is the signal there? Is it is distorted or not? It'll work. Okay. So that's so the, the real key is if you're looking for a probe to match your scope, the, the probe will have a rating on it over what input capacitance range can it be compensated for. So we'll say the, you know, the compensation range. It might be 10 to 30 picofarads or 15 to 30 picofarads or something. So you have to kind of know what your input capacitance is on your scope right on the front panel. So buy probes that can be compensated for that capacitance. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the one other mode that, we are, uh, that I mentioned is this XY mode. And XY mode is where, say, channel 1 drives the vertical position of the beam. Mm -hmm. Channel 2 drives the horizontal position of the beam. Okay? But why would we want to use that? I mean, so you can actually measure frequency if you have a known frequency going into one and an unknown frequency going into the other. You can get these little list of you patterns that can, you can count you know, frequency ratios by the number of loops or lobes on the waveform. You can look at measure the phase difference between two signals, okay? By looking at if, if both signals were exactly in phase, I mean it's like an ecto sketch turning both knobs the same way, you get a diagonal line, right? Just like that. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, if I turn them a little bit out of phase, I can get circles or ellipses and that kind of a thing. It's the same thing. So it's, it's an etch a sketch mode of the school. Okay. Um, not really handy, but there are applications where you can use something like that. This is kind of what it looks like if you hook up to the left and right channels of your stereo listening to Pink Floyd. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's kind of what that, that, where that came from. Okay. So you got frequency comparisons. You can do curve tracer applications. I actually have a couple of videos that show doing actual curve tracing with a little a simple circuit, you know, and tracing out X and Y curve tracing. But what's really useful for us is doing frequency response curves, sweeping an IF. If you've got a little signal generator that can sweep, okay, um, you can do a couple of things. You can set up that that sweeping signal through your device, your radio, whatever you're testing, through the IF chain, whatever it might be probe the output, and then either, if, you're, if the generator has a ramp output, whose ramp voltage is proportional to where the frequency is, and then a ramp go into X, and the output of your signal go into Y, and you essentially can trace out the shape of your IF voltage. Okay, and you can tune things in the IF and actually you know, watch that move around. This is a very dramatic example of very low frequency sweeping to a higher frequency or a kind of broadband band pass filter, but you kind of get the idea, you could do that. If your signal generator doesn't have a sweep voltage output that corresponds to your sweep, sometimes they'll just have a sync or a trigger output. Okay, so you can set the sweep to, you know, I want to sweep in 100 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds or something, and then set the scope up so that its sweep corresponds to the length of the amount of time you're sweeping the frequency, and then set the trigger to external, bring that trigger signal into the external input, so you trigger the scope at the beginning of your sweep, and every single sweep corresponds with your frequency sweep, and you can do the same type of thing. Pretty cool? So it can be pretty handy you know, for that kind of thing. It's a little tricky to set up, but man, you look at, you can see the shape of your filter. Not just peaking the magnitude of it, you can actually see what it looks like. So if you've got multiple tuned stages, you want to kind of bias tune them a little bit to give you a little bit broader bandwidth, versus having everything perfectly centered and narrow. You bias tune a little bit and kind of get a wider frequency response, you know, that type of thing. So, so that's what uh, one of the applications you can do more of an advanced thing using X, Y mode of the state. Yeah. Al Clace once gave us a lecture on using a uh, sweet generator mm -hmm. to set up the IFs in a, in a radio. But I was looking at some uh, 1950s uh, uh, radio te television news, yeah. and they had two articles on doing that exact same thing. Yep. And they said, setting up your radio that way separates the men from the boys. There you go. <laughs> and, and, and actually, a device that was pretty popular yeah. then was something called a wobulator. Yeah. Who's heard of a wobulator? Yeah. Right? So a wobulator is just a, 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 an oscillator that you can wobble back and forth. <laughs> uh, typically, it's wobbled back and forth at 60 hertz. OK? Well, that's handy. If I'm at 60 hertz, I can do a line triggering on the scope. OK? And I wobble the input and then just trace out what that signal looks like. And I'm synchronized to the line as I'm wobbly, 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 and I can very easily do that. So, but, uh, so that's kind of a, you know, another way to do it. And you might say, well, someone's selling a wobbulator. Now you know what you can use it for. Get your scope out. <laughs> so there you go. OK, so actually, there's another little thing here. Um, this, this little circuit, if you will, is called an octopus. Who's heard of an octopus before? Okay. So an octopus, a little filament transformer, a little series resistor, and we put a, a volt, one voltage across a resistor, one volt, one probe across your device under test. It's a little simple curve tracer. Right. Yeah. Sweep diodes, capacitors, things like that. You can build this with a couple of handful of parts and do it. And it, it, it you ever used a Huntron tracker? It's kind of the professional version of an octopus. Okay. It's just a simple curve tracer to see how the diode is good or something like that. Okay, so that's another example where X Y mode can be fun. Hmm. So the scope control layout. Um, typically, the controls are laid out in a semi-logical fashion. Okay, all of the vertical controls group together, usually near the vertical inputs. Okay, position control, vertical scale. Okay, coupling controls inputs. Okay, so vertical controls are grouped together here. Here's channel one and channel two vertical controls here. Okay, vertical controls here and here grouped together. Okay, vertical controls here grouped together. 
So looking at the scope is not just a sea of buttons, it's kind of more logically arranged now when you look at it. Same thing with the horizontal controls. Horizontal controls here, horizontal controls here, you know, horizontal controls here, okay? Triggering controls there, okay? So everything is kind of grouped together. So just work your way through, like, okay, I know my signal is going to be about two volts peak to peak, I want an AC couplet, boom, boom. I know it's going to be an audio type signal, eh, one or two millivolts of division. Throw all my trigger controls up to the top, <laughs> good to go, start probing your signals, okay? So most analog scopes are going to be laid out in a pretty logical fashion that way. Okay, no matter who makes them. Okay? So, how are we doing? Everybody good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, let's talk again a little bit of a word about safety when testing some of these old radios. I, I mentioned this earlier. Your multimeter probes, like my old Simpson 260 here, fully floating. I can connect the probes to any two nodes that I want. Well, they set the meter right. It doesn't matter. Nothing's connected to ground. The analog scope inputs are not that way. That input is not floating. One side of that probe, that little ground clip, is called ground because it's ground. Okay? Now, a lot of these old radios are not isolated, so use an isolation transformer. What I did here, just to be even further safe, I connected from the ground connection on the scope to the ground connection here. So I've tied ground together even before I attach the probes. So I, I make sure I don't do that. Now, mm. everything was fully floating. I could connect ground wherever I want, but now you might force the chassis to some other voltage. Because now I made 90 volts to the ground, so now the chassis is at minus 90 but, volts. But the classical screw up in the All American Five is where you burn the ground lead off the probe. Yes. <laughs> well, it, that's the best thing that can happen, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you can also hurt the scope. But if you burn the ground lead off and that was your fuse and told you, duh, I did something wrong, that was a good thing, right? But so, but. Um, so use an isolation transformer, establish a ground reference, and then from there you're just probing single-ended voltages with respect to that ground point. For any of the inputs, they're all with respect to that same point. Now if I want to measure voltage across a component, what do I do? Invert and add. Right? Two probes, invert and add. Okay? So again, one side's always connected to ground, always measure with respect to ground. Use of isolation transformers recommended, and use those 10x probes. It keeps the lethal voltages away from the scope input. Okay, and uh, well, that's you know, the rest of it's common sense. You guys work on this stuff, you know, and uh, you, know, you know what to do. But the, when you're dealing with a scope, all these inputs generally are connected to the same ground reference. Okay, so there are some special scopes that have fully isolated inputs, but that's not the norm case. It's an exception. Okay, they're generally all connected to ground. So, how do we take a look at signals inside an All-American 5 radio? This is not the exact schematic of the trainer here. Actually, I meant to do this earlier. Um, this is actually a photograph of that trainer that I put into paint shop and inverted the video. So black is white and white is black. So now you can actually see what that is. So I made copies of this for everybody. You want to grab a copy and pass it around. So if you want to follow along what we're doing. Um, you know, as you know, all the All American 5 radios, everybody's a little bit different. Generally, the same tube complement, but the circuits are similar, right? Yeah. There may be some differences. So, this this schematic I actually got uh, from another YouTuber, guy, all, channel, YouTube channel All American 5 Radio. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with him? Yeah. I mean, yeah Richard McWhorter. Great guy. Great guy. Really good, really nice videos. Very smooth videos, so they sure you get it. <laughs> but, it's, but he's a really good guy, fantastic explanations, and his illustrations are phenomenal, much better than what I do in my videos. Um, but, so I asked his permission if I could use his schematic because everything was so well done and color coded and everything here. So that's where that came from. Highly recommend uh, Richard's channel if you haven't uh, looked at it before. Um, so what do we want to look at, right? So at the front end of the scope, front end of the thing. Okay, who can tell me what's going on in that first tube? And what have I got coming in here? All right. What do you got? RF signals. Yeah. Right? yeah. What's going on down here? Oscillator. That's my local oscillator. So then they're getting mixed. So what have I got coming out? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Plus <laughs> everything else. At this point, right here, I've got IF, right, which is you know, LO minus my RF input, plus the RF input, plus the LO plus the sum, plus the sum and differences of multiples of those signals. So I got signals all over the place, harmonics. all right here in this current, Yes. right? 
But what's going to impress a voltage across this tuned circuit, right? This tuned circuit represents a high impedance only at your IF frequency. So all those other currents and all these other frequencies don't have a, lo a load to generate a voltage on. So the only voltage that gets generated across that first IF transformer, that tuned circuit, is at the IF frequency that you want, at 455 kilohertz. Okay, so that's generally what you're going to see if you probe this, because we're probing voltage, not probing the current. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, so that's what's going to appear there. But that might be pretty small. Okay? Yes. Generally, it's going to be, you know, it depends on the LO drive and things like that, but it might right. be pretty small. Okay? So then we've got an IF amplifier. That's going to take that small thing, make it a little bit bigger. But it's now still the amplitude modulated signal right. at the IF. Okay? Just a little bit bigger. But now, what happened? Now, the local oscillator is just a sine wave. Okay, you can kind of prove it there. But take a look at what's going on here. 10 to you know, 2 to 10 picofarads, 2 to 17 picofarads. What did I say that scope probe, the 10x probe in the capacitance was? 10 to 15 picofarads. Yeah. What happens if I put that probe there? That places 10 to 15 picofarads are parallel with this. 30 or 40 people. have an oscillator anymore. You know, the thing is, it's, 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 it's on the same order. It's a little bit less than this capacitance. So it'll probably still oscillate, but it's going to shift up in frequency. Yeah. Right? Actually, yeah, it's going to shift down. It's going to shift down in frequency. Well, yeah. because so it's going to shift down. If I increase the capacitance, it shifts down So it's going to bring, bring it down. So if I was tuned to a signal, I put my probe on here, I might not hear the signal anymore. But if I tune down, well, now I'll hear it. Because I've just changed the, the components in the tank circuit. Mm -hmm. But if you're just looking to see if the thing is oscillating or not, you can do that. Okay, it's oscillating, take it off. Okay, so but we'll, we'll kind of cover some of that again. And then we've got the detector. We've got to go through each of these sections. So mm. Richard did a nice job in color coding all these things. So let's kind of walk through these stage by stage. Okay, and then we'll go take a look at them right on the. On the you can thing. kind of see the oscillator if you hold the probe close. To the right. Yeah, a little loop. You can sometimes Put see it without the, affecting the, the most sensitivity. Just, just hang it near there. there. You can yeah, actually there. see there you the go. oscillator. Just to possibly couple to it without really loading it down. Now, this is the, the same page that I handed out. So, this is what we're going to be looking at. This is the schematic of this trainer here. So, uh, this is actually what we'll, go, what we'll go look at. All right. Let's first talk about the power supply. So, that's the power supply on our trainer. Okay, this is the one from, from Richard's circuit here. So what we're going to have is right after the rectifier, we're going to see the half-wave rectified you know, line signal. Okay? That's right after, the, right after the rectifier itself. And then on the other side of the filter cap, we're going to see hopefully not too much ripple, but probably some. Mm -hmm. So let's actually go look at that. This has got to slow on you, right? Yeah. I think we ran out of audio. Oh, okay. Well, it's okay. Let's, uh, let's just, for the power supply, we don't really care, right? So, um, so if we take a look, I kind of put up on the here on the scope controls about where you want to be with settings. Mm -hmm. V, H, and T. Vertical, horizontal, and trigger. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the vertical, we kind of want to be uh, AC coupled and in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 volts of division. All right. We move over here so you can get that uh, on the screen there. Sure. All right. And uh, yep. about five milliseconds of division. Okay, so we're looking at something that's just 60 hertz. Okay, 16 millisecond, uh, you know, 16.6 millisecond uh, time constant. Okay, I can the probe up here and get my glasses out so I know where I'm grabbing components. We look right after the rectifier. Okay, there's my halfway rectified, mm. you know, AC line. Okay. Make sure your diode's good, all right, everything's mm. working okay, all right? Now, on the other side of that cap, or the other side of that ballast resistor, I'm probing kind of on the one side of that 100 ohm resistor, it's right after the diode. If look at the other side of that, I'll be looking basically at the junction of that and the first filter cap, and that's the, the B plus for the audio transformer, right? Mm -hmm. For the audio output stage. If we go look at that, I can see a little bit of ripple on there. Uh, for ripple, I need to go down to about two volts of division. So now I'll bring my scope down to two volts of division. I'm AC coupled, so now I can actually still see that. Right. I didn't do it, but I can switch my triggering over to line triggering, so now I don't, don't worry about that. In fact, we could take, let's take channel two. We turn channel two on. I'll bring that to, say that 20 millivolts or 20 volts of division. And let's set that to chop. And let's connect this guy up to the other side of the 100 ohm resistor, and we kind of see how these two things work together. Okay. 
So if I made this guy that same, let's make this guy say 10 volts of division, I'll move it, it down. Okay, and if I adjust this guy to that same 10 volts of division, I can kind of see how these two things relate, right? I'm driving up the peak, and then I ripple down, I drive up the peak, I ripple down, mm. you can see the relationship of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's our power supply voltage, right? Uh, now on the, uh, again, on, on uh, channel one here, I'm looking at, this is the ripple that is going right to our, our 50L6 output tube. Mm -hmm. So if I probe, you know, that's, like, that's right at the primary of my output transformer. So if we go to look at okay. that, right, let's go bring this guy, well, yeah, we're going to go look at audio circuits here in a moment, but uh, let me go grab that guy over here. Um, and let's turn our volume up. Let's see. I'm going to go the wrong side of that here. Hold on. Yeah, you want pin four? Yeah. Let's see. Some of these are still backwards. But you kind of just see the audio on there a little bit, right? A little bit. But So this is where it can be really handy to be able to look at... Um, Actually, you know what? Here. It helps if I use the right probe. There we go. That's what I was doing. So you can see the audio is sitting on top of that ripple. Right? Yeah. But why doesn't it matter? Well, let's talk about the audio circuit, we'll talk about why it doesn't matter. Let's go back here. Okay. All right, so, so we're going to work back to that. So I started at the front end here. So, um, <laughs> so sorry. Hang on for that. I know you're all weak. <laughs> okay. So the front end signals. Okay, we got our. RF input coming from the antenna here, that's going to be pretty small. You're not going to be able to see anything with the scope probe down the bottom. No. Okay, All right. You can probe the local oscillator. Uh, like I said, we, Harry said you can kind of bring the probe near it to see that it's oscillating. Good enough. If you actually want to measure the voltage, you're going to have to probably connect to it. Okay, it will shift. Okay, the, the frequency. In fact, if we go look at that, let's go look at that. Let's take uh, let's take my probe over here. Okay, and let's, I'm tuned to a signal here, right? And let's go and, uh, let's see, we want to go, and look right at power. Let's see. And let's see, let's uh, speed that way up. And let's go to trigger on the input there. There's my local oscillator signal. Okay, and if I tune it, see the frequency changing? Yes. Okay. 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 It just detuned a little bit because I was including that capacitance in where I was tuned. Right? Now I gotta adjust the frequency of this back again a little bit. Okay? Mm. So, so that, just be aware that that's gonna happen, right? But that's yeah, so, okay. Right? So the probe capacitor is just added to the bread slicer. It's, it's like exactly it's like adding another another yeah. trimmer to it. Okay. Time, time's one from you won't have an oscillator. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, if they're too much, you might throw the thing out of the spot where it can't isolate line. anymore. If that happens, just tune down, you know, tune up to the highest frequency so that it gives you, so if you pad that, it'll come down to a lower frequency where it'll oscillate again. So I really wanted to see if it's oscillating. And you saw we were looking at, uh, what we were looking at here, about 10 volts of division. So we had a good 30 volts peak to peak there on this particular radio. I don't know what the variation is. You guys know, know better than I was how big that drive is. But that's kind of what you'd see. Right. So it'll typically the frequency will be the signal you're tuned to plus 455, right? So you're going to be up in the one to two megahertz type frequency range. So running, you know, on the order of a few microseconds of division to be able to see that. All right. Uh, look at the output of the converter tube, right? This is where we're going to see the IF signal. And I think I've got. Do I have a tap on this one? Let's see. Actually, I don't. I can look at the output of the IF transformer. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now what am I looking at here? It's a pretty small signal, right? Because, like as I said, the inputs, the signal that appears here is going to be pretty small. And it's small for two reasons. One, it's, it's the very first stage. We haven't amplified the IF yet. We're only just dumping this into the first transformer. And I put 10 picofarads across this capacitor. I just detuned it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so now I can see the ripple because I'm looking at just a few millivolts of division over here now, right? I'm at 20 millivolts, 200 millivolts of division. But I can see that something's there. But I think it's okay if it's ugly. 
All right. That's not what we're trying to see here. Just want to see if something was there accomplished. Right? Mm -hmm. And the other part of the problem is that this thing being a trainer, everything's all spread out. My ground connection's over here. My probe's over here. I've got a really big loop that's <laughs> picking up 60 cycles. Okay, when you're inside the chassis of your radio, you're not going to generally see that problem. So the ripple here is more than what's really in the circuit. It's just being picked up by the probe group. Okay? But don't be worried if you can't see it. Again, you guys know when you need to defeat the ABC to kind of get, get a better uh, view of things. Okay? Your note here, probe capacitance will detune the circuits. It will detune and adjust your LO. It will detune the load for the converter, the converter tube. Just be aware of it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the next stage is our IF, uh, oh, I went backwards. <laughs> the next stage is our IF signals. So let's look at the output of the IF. So what have I got there? It's going to be larger than the input. I'll promise, in this case, I'm going to have, still have some ripple because I still got this big loop. Uh, I'm not going to, de the detuning isn't going to be as bad in this case because um, the signal is larger. Okay. And, but looking at the detector output, we're going to actually be pretty good. Uh, we can actually see that. So let's actually go look at those two. Right. And uh, let's see, what do we say? For the IF out, I want AC coupling about 50 millivolts of division, probably a little bit more than that in this particular case. Uh, let's see. Let's kind of bring my, I'm going to bring my sweep back down here. So a couple of milliseconds of division. Again, I got a little bit of ripple on here. So if I trigger on line, I can kind of stabilize that. See how the, the signal's tilted? It's because I'm looking at one portion of my ripple waveform. Okay? Mm. But by se selecting line trigger, it's a lot better than doing that where things are bouncing around. I can actually yeah, get a better agree. view of what's going on in the IF by looking at my line trigger. Okay? It's causing detection. You can see your amplitude varying with the audio. Yep. Yep. So, so that's the my IF stage. We'll look at the out output of the, the detector, which is uh, uh, right here. Much, much bigger. Okay? Well, actually... I'm filtered there where I want to look, where I want to look is actually right here. Let's see. Oh, that's where I was. Which one did I pick? Well, I figured out one of these was actually uh, oh, one of the caps. One of them was one of them is disconnected, so and one of these is actually backwards. But um, but uh, anyway, we, we can go through and look at these things. So there's our there's my audio actually sitting at the top of the uh, top of the uh, the pot here right now. Okay. Uh, let's see. We can also look. Let's see. One of these I figured out was disconnected. There it is. That's the one I want to look at. So so that's the um, looking at the detected output. Okay. So uh, we're we're essentially the the diode here is clipping the top half of my IF envelope. And we're just looking at the audio variation on the bottom of that IF envelope. Okay. What's key there is that you still have an, an IF envelope. You still have an IF. It's just kind of chopped. Once you go past the top. detector to the filter, it exactly. shorts out all the RF. Right. You only have the audio yeah. left. So that's what we're looking at over here. Again, these are these are approximate settings. You play with them as you needed. A lot of it's going to depend on the signal strength you got going into the radio and that kind of thing. Um, and then if we go take a look at uh, the audio signals themselves. Uh, Let's see, a couple of places we can go look, right? Uh, if we look at the, the, you know, the, the drive to the grid of uh, the output tube, the, the level there is going to depend on where you set the volume. So we can just go look at the top of the pot, and then we don't care where the volume is. Right. right. So, and, and because we've got you know, a couple of capacitors here, we're actually going to start stripping some of the IF off and just look at the audio. Let's bring that guy down here. This is one of the ones that's wired backwards. The top oh. of the pot is the bottom of the pot. Okay. Okay. So, so there's my audio signal. Okay. Can I actually see that? And again, not going to depend really too much on volume here now. So we load it slightly differently, but we're just looking at the uh, the audio signal now that we're going to pick off to go into the input of the tube. Let me give you a little less RF, maybe off That's okay. It's all right. Yeah, I think we go measure the ABC and see how, yeah, how much we're really driving that down. But. There. And they're okay. And then we can go look at you know, other portions that we wanted to look at. The, uh, we talked about earlier being able to look at the, at the output here. 
and just go here. So this is the output of the tube. Again, I, I got the audio kind of riding on top of that ripple, right? So I got that volume going here. Okay, and I don't know if I bring the volume up, that'll go way up. So I got the audio riding on top of that ripple. So if I go down to line trigger, and now I can just see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if I just want to see that voltage, the, the audio itself, let's bring on channel two, set that to the same voltage rating. Okay, let's go prove that voltage. All right, there it is. Okay. Looks just like, uh, let's see, that's my ripple voltage, right? <laughs> let's do a invert and add and turn off channel one and channel two. There's just the audio. Yeah. All right. Mm. So now I can do this without blaring the radio. And yes. And see what that thing looks like. Okay. Now we will do an add and subtract based on the scales. So if I change my vertical scale, it won't add a subtract rate. Okay, because all that, that's all being done after the input attenuator and things like that. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to look at you know, higher volume levels, I have to turn both of these up to that same level to get the same, the right subtraction again. Okay? So that's a nice handy trick, you know, since you don't have a differential probe, you know, to kind of get rid of it. Now, why, why does that work, and why don't I hear the hum? If I got, I got four volts of ripple there, why don't I hear that? 107 volts of audio, and four volts of the scheme well, of things is pretty small. It's not even that, but if I look, even if I, when I was listening to it uh, down this low volume here, right, I'm just going to go back down here, that's a fair amount, that's, I got more ripple than I got audio. Why don't I hear it? So the key is that the, the tube is modulating its current back and forth, right? That current, the, the, the top, is, if you will, the top in terms of voltage of the output transformer is bouncing up and down. The current going through the tube is creating a voltage across the coil. Mm. That whole thing is bouncing up and it's down. Just right? going all over place. So the signal, the, the ripple is common mode. It's, it appears on both sides of the transformer. And the only thing that transfers across the transformer is the, vol is the differential voltage mm -hmm. across the coil. So the ripple effectively gets rejected then just gets because beat. it's common mode yeah. to the transformer. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so what we do with the scope with subtracting things is exactly what happens here to here. Which is why you don't see, you're not hearing the hum from the ripple. Which is why it doesn't matter so much there. It does matter later on because those voltages are kind of being processed all with respect to ground. Mm -hmm. This one's being processed with respect to the other side of the transformer. Right. Okay? So it doesn't matter so much. But that's why I say you can have a fair amount of ripple on that, that first B plus before that next ballast resistor, but that's still okay. Okay. So we let's use the difference measurement to actually measure what the audio is doing. Okay. Pretty cool? Yeah. Cool. Alright. So why, why don't you why don't you probe the top of the volume control for DC and show them how that indicates Signal straight. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's actually get my let's go, let's turn channel two off here, let's turn all this add and invert stuff off. Let me grab uh, this is a good measurement to make when you're doing it online. Alright, so let's uh, what I'm gonna do is switch my coupling here to DC coupling. Alright. If I go to ground, I can see where ground is. I can adjust ground to a spot on the screen and say, okay. With ground coupling at the input, that's ground. All right. So if I go, now go to DC coupling, I can see my signal is going below ground. Okay. We would change our signal strength to the input of the radio. See how the DC is changing? The stronger you get in, D, in this, the more negative you go. That's your automatic volume control. All right. Because in the ABC circuit, that signal goes through another low-pass filter that effectively turns the average of that into a DC voltage. Get, that gets applied to the grids of the, the IF amplifier and the mixer. You can go to that further and look at that and show them the line. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's actually going to do that. The flat line you went up and down. Let's, let's, bro let's go over here and bring this probe over. And what we're going to do is DC couple that probe, turn on channel two. I'm going to put that ground up here as well. And we'll probe that guy there. So we can actually see where that voltage is. That's the flat line up there now. Okay, if I pull that away, let me, let's actually make that a bit more sensitive. You just look at the DC one. Yeah, so, and there's, there's your ABC, right? More signal strength, more negative bias on the ABC, cuts the gain down on those tubes. So it's like a closed feedback system that adjusts 
the gain throughout the radio depending on signal strength coming in. Yeah, if you're doing something like an alignment or something very crucial, uh, the the 10, 10 meg probe will load the ABC line where yep. it won't work right. Yeah. Okay. It won't work the way it's supposed. Right, right. So it gives you an idea of where things are. It's a good idea to kind of look sometimes at the ABC to be sure that you're, when you're peaking the IFs, you're also peaking the most negative excursion of the, of the ABC at the same time. Okay, or you can defeat the ABC, you know, the ABC by shortening the ABC right. cap and then keeping the gain constant so that the uh, in-signal strength doesn't change the gain of what you're looking at. Okay. So if you're sweeping, sometimes that can really wiggle things around all over the place. So by keeping the ABC at some constant voltage when you're doing, I guess, the swept thing with the XY will keep, keep things a bit more stable. Yeah, usually they tell you if you're sweeping, just throw like a 3-volt signal on the ABC line. There you go. Yes, that keeps the gain constant, constant. and then so that's not going to be changing along with everything else that's changing when you're sweeping through. So that will make, th make things a little less confusing to the radio <laughs> and to what you're doing. Okay. So again, AC or D, so a couple of things here. Scopes give you a view of what's going on with voltage versus time. It can be really handy. Look at distortion, clipping, issues like that. Beware of ground. Scopes want to be connected to ground. Okay, some of these radios aren't too so friendly about that. Okay, just be aware of it. Again, AC or DC coupling doesn't refer to the signal type. It could be handy. DC coupling here to look at DC variations of a waveform, DC offsets of a waveform, but most of the time we're using AC coupling just to look at waveform shapes. Okay. The IF and LO signals, um, if you want to actually see the, I, the, the 455 kilohertz sinusoidal IF, where you want to look at the LO, a microsecond per division or faster to kind of stretch that out and see the sine wave. For IF envelope and AF signals, a few milliseconds per division works well. Line triggering to keep the ripple stable when you're looking at signals where there is ripple present. You're just like, okay, I know it's there, I don't care about it, let's keep it stable, and now my waveform is just riding on top of that. Okay, so it's come handy ways to use a scope, you know, to go play with these radios. And sometimes it's just fun. You don't have to be working on it. Just with that. <laughs> but I remember I bought my first scope, I was actually a, I was a freshman or sophomore in high school and I had an electronics elective. And they, we had an old Alan B. Dumont cathode ray oscillograph for current sweep scope that the, the school was throwing out. And I got it and I put it in my room and I you know, watched Pink Floyd and XY mode. <laughs> so in my room. So that's, that's what you did with these things. But, uh, you know, and for me, as, as a design engineer, analog design engineer, um, I visualize what's going on in circuits kind of the same way the scope visualizes signals, you know, higher voltages or higher elevation. So it's a very natural way for me to look at what's going on with signals. And with DC coupling, it's said you can establish that a ground is here, a voltage rail is there, you can see where your voltages are sitting with respect to a voltage rail. Am I clamping up against the rail, am I banging down into, you know, if I'm looking at a, a transistor circuit, am I collapsing, you know, collector emitter voltage and saturating the transistor, you can see those things by seeing where things live within the supply rails. Okay. So it's a very visual way of thinking about what's going on with signals throughout the system. But anyways, that's what I have. Any questions? I really appreciate all your time. Yeah. So if I'm looking at like a SAMS and it's got wave oh. pictures in there to try to help you figure out what you're doing or yep. whether there's something wrong, a lot of those parts of the set you're talking about, you're loading it down. Are those pictures assuming it's generally they down? are. Like it, that's the picture of this loaded down. Yeah, generally, generally they're going to have you look at spots that aren't going to be too much affected by loading. Okay. And they'll usually specify the beginning of the SAMs. Use All a 10x probe. Right. Use the, the, the probe with this capacitance or less. Right. As long as you're adhering to that, then that, that that's the expectation. Right. Right. Okay. And most of the time they're going to say, don't probe here, but probe there, because here it'll be the less effective. It's a lower impedance port of the circuit or something like that. Okay. Exactly right. And I usually tell you, it's there's so many so many volts per division, so many right. microseconds per division. That's the wave shape you should see. And what Matt's talking about, you can get away without a scope with radios. You get the television sets. Right. Yeah. You need yeah. a scope. Yeah. If you get a television set and it says "Do not measure," believe it. <laughs> <laughs> probe the flyback, right? Yeah. 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 Probe the second probe 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 is not a good idea. We're gonna melt it. You let the smoke out of the scope and. Yeah. Any other questions? Nobody snore? Nobody snore. <laughs>